Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on school safety. Uh, looking forward to the, the conversation that we're going to be able to have today. I really appreciate it when people take time out of busy schedules. This is during the work day for many, I know. Uh, so thank you for making this investment in um, school safety in particular. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment. Uh, and we are really excited about having Paul Tim uh, join us and share. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But I wanted to also preview uh, for you a resource, a package of resources that Adventist Risk Management is uh, has prepared and is planning to send out uh, with your help and uh, cooperation um, in just a couple of months. So let me uh, share that with you. It's a package of, of resources and information and um, there is significant investment in this package of resources. So we hope that for those of you working in education at, at whether it's an academy, a K through eight, K through 12, uh, whatever the case may be, that you will find some real value in, in the resources provided in this package. I wanna highlight two, um, two resources in particular. Uh, the first is, you may have heard of an organization called ALICE. Um, Adventist Risk Management happens to have been able to negotiate uh, some some work with Alice. Uh, they provide um, training, uh, resources, information on uh, how to work with in a violent, how to respond in a violent incident. Uh, so they have online training. They do you know physical training in in your location. They do a number of different uh, blended learning exercises. Um, I've had the opportunity to go through the some of their courses and then actually go through some of their uh, instructor certification. And I found it to be very, very uh, beneficial, very helpful for me, uh, provided good background. And they have this organized by different environments. So what we're doing is we're including, and it's a $25 value. Uh, we're including a voucher for schools where you can actually have one person go through that online training uh, for free. Adventist Risk Management has already paid for that. And you can see that it is going to be specific to K through 12 schools. Uh, so we, we just wanted to make that resource available. There are other similar resources um, that are also fantastic, excellent. There's a number in the marketplace that all have very similar uh, models. Uh, we just happen to coordinate with Alice. They have a long-standing tradition and a very well-packaged product um, that was, uh, and they were very, very willing to work with us to make that happen for you. So we're excited about that. Hope that you will be as well. Uh, and then the other main resource um, that I wanted to highlight for you is very connected with our speaker today. Uh, Paul Tim literally wrote the textbook on school security, which is going to be the top of topic of our, our discussion, and Adventist Risk Management has purchased a one of these books for every school in North America. So we would like to ship that to each of each of you. Uh, so we'll be doing that. Uh, my goal is to do that end of July, early August, so that as, as everyone's kind of getting back to school, uh, you'll be able to have that package of resources and information available when you get back and are getting everything going for the new year. We can have a bright new safe year. Well that's a good segue into introducing our our speaker today and that is uh, Paul Tim. Uh, Paul is a physical security professional. Uh, he's a Christian. Um, he's actually done a lot of education in in that as well. Um, we had the privilege of, of inviting Paul, having him speak at the Risk Management Conference last year, September of 2018, uh, and his message was clear, it was effective, and well-received by, by the, um, our audiences there at the conference. So I wanted to thank you, Paul, for taking the time to join us here again today. Uh, welcome, 
and I'm going to turn things over to you and let you let you run from here. Thank you, David. I greatly appreciate it. Good morning uh, to you and to all of the attendees. It's uh, it's an honor to be part of this. I am based in Chicago, where today is, I don't know, roughly about 60 degrees, which for mid to end of June is a little disappointing. Um, but uh, I was in Las Vegas the last couple of days, and um, and it was 105 degrees. So there you go. It's uh, it's always really interesting to to see the how things work out. Well, uh, I want to talk about just a couple of main keys, and the first key is always collaboration. Everything that we're doing requires a collaborative effort, and when I say a collaborative effort, we always want to make sure that we're doing um, that we're following what is a top-down commitment. And I, I know that in our organizations, um, we and, and in our churches, in our schools, we all want to be on the same page and and lockstep. And you know, maybe this denomination has that better than most, uh, but it doesn't always work out that way. And so, what what I want to really say is, please let's make sure that we've got buy-in in the fact that we want to provide a safe learning environment and the stewardship responsibilities that come along with that right from the top. Now, um, I want to share just a quick story. When my daughter was in middle school, she had to write an essay. She could choose the theme, and then she had to have three, um, three points to support that theme. And she came to me and said, Dad, I'm, I'm writing this. I've got just uh, two points, and I'm wondering if you can help me with the third. And I said, I don't know. What, what's your theme? And, and her theme was why students at XYZ Middle School shouldn't have to wear IDs. And whether it's IDs or uniforms or whatever, sometimes students just don't want that. And I said, well, I disagree with your premise, so I'm not going to help you. Now, I did not say that. What I said is, um, tell me, please, wh what are your points? And her first point was, why is it such a big deal that students have to get with the program in this fashion if not all of our teachers are with the program in that fashion? And of course, all that is saying is even in middle school, students recognize if uh, we're not modeling behaviors that we expect. I said, okay, and what's your second point? And her second point was, um, you know, why is it such a big deal that we have to conform in this fashion when people are just leaving exterior doors propped open? And again, very difficult to argue with that kind of logic. And so I want to... I just want to say, what are we doing to make sure we have buy-in all the way from the top? Um, you know, that it's interesting. I was at a, what's called the Campus Safety Conference in Las Vegas, and one of the, you know, speakers was a lady that had been able to step in um, and talk with a student who had brought a gun and additional ammunition to school um, before he did that. And she had no idea when she got to school that day that she was going to be maybe the last resort. She had no idea that a student could come. You know, maybe she expected students have troubles and issues, but not that one would come and say, you're the only thing standing between me and acting out. What do you have to say? And she was also a person of faith. She, she was able to talk with this young man for oh, well in excess of 30 minutes and, um, and help him decide to, to not carry out what he was going to carry out. She was the keynote speaker at a big conference and she said, I just don't, I, I, you know, my, my story is a faith story. I don't know if I can share it here or not. And I said, let's, you know, let's pray right now. We want to have boldness, not so that we can tell everybody what we think they should do, but we should be able to tell everybody what really happened. And, and that was a big deal. We have that um, purpose and, and the mission statement of, of the conference. And, and you want to just be modeling these kinds of behaviors all up and down the board. Documentation is a big deal. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but we have heard the phrase, see something, say something. I'm gonna make um, some more emphasis on that later. But whatever we see that is an issue, we want to send an email, a text, something that has an audit trail um, so that we make sure that, um, that that will be addressed. One more thing I want to say about documentation is all of us, you'll see this in the book, there's a chapter on practices that should be documented. I'm going to just give an example of one, and that is 
the off-site school-sanctioned event practice. And again, this is going to come in the book, but basically what it says is anybody who's involved in a school sanctioned offsite event must have an accountability partner back at the school so that when, where you, whenever you get to where you're going and let's just say you're going to go across the county or across the state on a school sanctioned event, you're required to contact that person when you get to where you're going. And I don't mean the parking lot, I mean the actual room where you'll be spending your time to set up a lifeline of communications. And I know it might sound basic to you, but most schools don't have a written practice like that. And we wanna have something in place like that now, instead of uh, going through a painful incident and then crafting one in the aftermath. Hmm. Accountability, uh, we may not be large enough at our individual locations to have safety planning teams, but I'm gonna sure suggest you have a group of people that are meeting maybe once a semester to say what are the goals, what are what are the things that we want to accomplish, maybe new measures that we have in place this year, concerns that that have been raised. Um, I recommend once a semester, 60 minutes top. If you can be less than that, that's great. David informed me even for this webinar, let's be less than 60 minutes if possible, because we all have thresholds of tolerance. Um, and then let's put the most important information at the top so that if we can't cover everything, we can table more ancillary items later, but please. And in that safety planning team, I'm strongly encouraging you to have student representation. There's more about that coming here in just a minute, but students are ahead of us in technology. They've got a much better pulse of what's really going on. We want to have them involved. In terms of mass notification, we, I would hope at your individual schools, churches, uh, that we have um, some kind of electronic mass notification system. It sends group texts, it sends group emails. Maybe you still have a phone tree. I don't know for sure, but you want to always consider, um, you always want to uh, make sure that you're improving upon that, that your system is redundant, that there's more than one person that can operate it, and that if, especially you're across the street, maybe from a public school or down the road and, and around the corner from a public school or a community college or a large entity like that, that someone in that organization is also on your list and you are on their list. If something's happening in close quarters of the community, we want to know about it ahead of time. In security, the fastest ones win. And whether you were a watcher on the wall back in the Old Testament or you're in administration in a school, time is of the essence. Um, and then finally, students, especially by the time we get to high school level, students should be on the mass notification system as well because they have um, off-site off events like vocational events, uh, athletic events. And they're far more likely to have the iPhone 10 than we are. We should make sure that if we have an incident, we can notify them so that if they were on their way back to the school, but it's dangerous right now, we can help them divert their course. So, so please, whatever we're doing, let's improve our mass notification. Okay, and my, my right click, oh, there we go, good, thank you very much. All right, for, uh, um, I wanna talk about developing NIMS, which is the National Incident Management System. It's really just a simple chart, as you can see on the left. The National Incident Management System at its base level has what's called an incident command system. I'm really trying hard not to go with acronyms today, by the way, but ICS is Incident Command System. It basically says whether we're police, fire, school, or any entity, we want to all manage emergencies at the basic foundational levels the same. So you'll see at the top, we have an incident commander. Your principal will probably be your incident commander. You will have, if you look at the bottom, somebody in charge of operations. That might be your facilities person. Um, all of these will be self-explanatory, but at the end, I'm going to give you a link for um, a course that you can take for free online that would certify you in this basic incident command system course of uh, the NIMS 100 is what it's called. Now, many of us are saying, yep, but at my school, um, I could never fill in eight boxes. There's only six of us. Or at my school, I am the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. I, I understand how all of that works. 
Um, so on the right, what we're doing is we're giving you the option of, of finding out who can help you in response. And this is called the Staff Skills Survey. If, if you don't love it here, you can simply Google that. If you have a hard time Googling things, find somebody younger than you. But the Staff Skills Survey can be completed by all of your staff in a matter of moments because we either have these credentials and areas of expertise or we don't. Um, so I, 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 again, I won't go through the whole thing, but um, I would wonder who at your school is currently certified in first aid, CPR, and AED. I would wonder who speaks more than just English as a language. Um, I would be wondering who keeps emergency supplies in their vehicles and what kinds of supplies. All of these things then we can um, kind of inventory and make available at least to administrators, but probably beyond, so that if we do find ourselves in an emergency, we know who our go-to people are. And if we are building the ICS structure, like you see on the left, we can make sure that we have um, people who are well qualified in every position. Now, I will say one more thing. ICS wants you not just to have these people but it wants you to have a backup for each position and a backup for the backup. I know that that's difficult, but Murphy's Law says the first time our principal is gone is the first time we have an incident. So that's why we want to build redundancy into these kinds of, of programs. Okay, let me talk about awareness. And I want to say this, in so many of our schools, we have inadvertently adopted the Mayberry mentality, meaning we, we just think that everything is going to be situation normal all the time. And I want to be sensitive, David, you're going to laugh at this, but people on the call might be um, not just younger than me, but significantly younger. If you don't know what Mayberry means, it comes from the Andy Griffith show. And they lived in a town in the Carolinas that was so sweet and so harmless that there was really never any danger. But we don't live there. Now, we live in a place where we know that God is our refuge. Um, so that's good. But we also know that we're not free of problems and issues. That's where stewardship comes in. So from an awareness standpoint, I want to talk about a few things that can help you change the culture from a Mayberry mindset to more of a see something, say something mindset. Um, and, and the first thing I like, and I've, again, I've got a chapter on the book, so you can look out for that as I whet your appetite, but I think we should carve two or three minutes out of every staff meeting to talk about something that's safety related. And in that two or three minutes, we can, um, we can show a photo of something in a parking lot and, and remove that photo and ask people, what did you just see? People who for the entire course of their careers have always parked in the same parking space could use a little quiz like that. Um, there are wonderful videos. Again, in, in the chapter I have on staff development, you'll find a number of suggestions on how to get that done. Um, I like trivia and we'll, we'll do a little bit trivia of trivia later on in this presentation. I, I think people are much more prone to remember and if we can keep it to two or three minutes, we're not disrupting our meeting. In fact, we're giving them something to look forward to and is equipping them along the way. A positive reinforcement is really just saying add a girl or add a boy for, for people who are with the program. We've now said you shouldn't prop door, doors open. They're no longer um, um, following that wrong behavior. And let's, you know, maybe hand them... Uh, Listen, you can do it any way you want, but um, positive reinforcement is a way to go. Security education, really important as well. Some of us are further down the road of, of, with security measures than others, but what we've typically done is, for example, installed cameras over the summer when main teachers are gone, and then they come back after the summer, there's these new measures in place, but they don't know much about it. We haven't educated them. I think that that's a mistake. We want to tell people what we're doing and why. And wherever we have a camera becomes a safer passage to walk in, at least from a forensic standpoint, um, from a justice standpoint. So please, security education, very, very important. See Something, Say Something is one of these initiatives where we're going to be seeing banners like over here on the left. 
Uh, of course, the thing that we're missing on this banner is a way to report. Um, that, that's going to be very important. In some of our states, we will have an anonymous school violence tip line. And I know that, you know, as a believer, I agree with separation of church and state, but there's going to be some some resources that we want to take advantage of that could be a real help to us as well that others have already um, introduced. On the right, you see the Branson Convention Center and you say, well, what does that have to do with schools? This is a screenshot of their electronic signboard. So imagine, if you will, I go into the Branson Convention Center, I see an electronic signboard and it's scrolling announcements. It's got um, this association will be in that ballroom and this association is meeting in, in meeting rooms A and B. And I looked at it, I watched it loop. After a couple minutes, I saw all of the announcements they were then repeating. And I went to the safety person, the public safety person, and I said, wouldn't it be good if you could also scroll to see something, say something announcement? And he said, yeah, if I would ever get the permission to do that. Well, a couple days later, he sent me this photo. He did get permission. And while this will not win aesthetics awards, um, they now have it scrolling on all of the monitors at the Branson Convention Center. Well, fast forward to a couple months later, I, I contacted him and I said, well, have you received any, any calls at all? And he said, yep, just a handful. Um, in the in, in made up of two categories. In the first category, they were lost and found inquiries. And of course, that makes us all smile, but there's nothing really wrong with that to be customer focused and helping people expect if it's not uh, a real nuisance. And in the second category, he said, was they had received a couple messages, um, a couple of phone calls where people thought they saw suspicious behavior. They immediately dispatched security. When security came on the scene, they found that it was not a suspicious situation, but that um, they could see that that it, how it would be deemed that. And and so um, you know, it's 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 good information. Thank you. We've moved on to involving youth, and I, I just want to always mention because I am a physical security guy, and people say, "Well, you just think that all of these devices will save the world?" No, um, I, I believe that Jesus saves first of all, but second of all, I believe that relationships are most important. And as I talk with teachers, um, I do know if there's one thing I know about teachers, it's that they like kids. Now, hopefully we haven't had experiences in careers that have jaded that or altered that um, because I think, I would hope people that go into teaching do it because uh, again, they value, they, they enjoy spending time, they craft relationships very easily. So I, I, I wanna say the bottom line is this, what we don't do is have good relationships so we can get information from kids about potentially bad things that are happening. That's not why we do it. We do it because we love people and we love students. But a byproduct of that is sometimes the student comes to a trusted adult like, like teacher and, and says, listen, I just, I, 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 this is what I heard, or this is what I know, or in fact, the situation I was talking about at the Campus Safety Conference in Las Vegas, that keynote presenter was a trusted adult that this student came to. Um, I'm not anticipating you're going to have weapons incidents, but again, I just think let's craft those relationships, let's remind people how important they are, and, and then let's foster them. Um, the second thing I want to say is involves social media, and, and that makes everybody's eyes roll because we know of all the inherent dangers with social media. Um, one more thing um, about my book, I've got a chapter on social media risks and solutions. Because um, the book was written a couple of years ago, it might not be as up to date, and, but what could be in social media is what I'm wondering. If I do edition number two now and a year from now, I, I just wonder if, if six months from then we'll have to shift again. My point in bringing all this up is students are generally more adept at this, more familiar with this, and more involved in this. And I want to suggest that we involve students and maybe give them a two or three minute segment of one of our staff meetings to tell us all what Snapchat is and how it works. 
Um, I, I want to confess to all of you on this call that I have a Snapchat account. Um, please don't think less of me, but my daughter a couple of years ago came to me and said, Dad, I'd really like you to have a Snapchat account. And I said, I really don't want to. Um, but in the end, I relented. And I, I want to tell you this. From a relational standpoint, it's been a really wonderful vehicle of communications. And social media doesn't go away because I think it's bad. I would rather be in the water and helping people swim than watching people do ridiculous things in the deep end of the pool and have no ability to help them. So um, anyway, she, she got me involved in Snapchat. I instantly started finding videos, photos, et cetera, that I would never have had access to before. But I, I want to say this. Maybe the more painful thing for us as adults is when I asked her about Snapchat and features, she is the teacher. I am the learner. I know that's different from the way we grew up. In fact, what I like to say is this. We are the... And, and, I'm guessing people in this on this webinar are in their 40s. I'm just guessing. Um, I'm 51. Maybe we're all in the same ballpark. But my generation is the most ignorant generation in the history of mankind. And the reason I say that is this. When I grew up, who knew more about what was going on in the world, me or my parents? Well, obviously my parents. I, I didn't have a cell phone. I, I, my parents read the newspapers. Sometimes I read the comics uh, or the sports. Um, my parents, I mean, if I had to write a paper, I had to find an encyclopedia or my mom had to drive me into the library to get microfish. But who has more information on, and knowledge about what's happening in the world today, us or our kids? And I really hope none of you are really are, are thinking that it's you. Our, our kids do. They, they can access information with speed and efficiency that we, we may never catch up to. And so what I'm saying is, let's bring them into the conversation. Let's dip our toe into the waters. And here is just a little um, screenshot um, in the next slide of, of where we can begin. Here we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, this is Facebook. And again, there are some of you going and I'm so glad I'm not on it. I think it's a mistake to not be on Facebook. First of all, it's a really wonderful means of mass notification. Um, maybe a little bit more about that later. But Facebook is the only social media place that is bonafide security settings. And what I've shown you here is, is circled the code generator, which is nothing more than two-factor authentication. And a lot of people will say, okay, thank you for clearing up nothing. What is two-factor authentication? What it means is if I enable this feature, the code generator, and then I'm in a place where I'm going to check my Facebook um, because I'm just that... <laughs> connected with it. Um, and I go to enter my username and password so I can log in from a device that's not mine. Um, if I've enabled the code generator, it will not allow me with username and password to get in. I would put username and password, hit submit, and then it would text me a unique code as the second factor of authentication to be able to get in. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's nice, and you're still not convincing me to be on Facebook. But we should be using two-factor authentication for anything and everything that we're doing online. I hope you all know that Google has two-factor authentication. Your online bank has two-factor authentication. And again, maybe you've been able to miss a lot of these things or avoid a lot of these things. I just, the whole concept of two-factor authentication is a sound principle that you want to uh, take a hold of. And whether you're using um, and, and in certain places on the internet or not, shouldn't people that you know who are be be aware of this? You you are hereby deputized. Um, now I've got four kids. All of I'm an empty nester. All of them are in college, are beyond. Some of them should no longer still be in college, but are. But anyway, um, what I did is made sure that on Facebook I know how to get to the college um, Facebook page. And I follow those universities that my kids go to on Twitter. Twitter and Facebook are the two chief methods of mass notification. And, and my daughter, who goes to Olivet Nazarene University, she could be on the campus where an incident is occurring and not even be aware of it if she's not right front and center. 
but the university is going to put information out through Twitter and through Facebook that might be vital for somebody like me. Um, and I can't trust that the local news network or cable station is going to talk um, about the right things. Let's talk about prioritization. In schools, we're trying to protect people first. Um, I grew up at Argonne National Labs and people were not the number one asset there. The number one asset in Argonne was things, asset category, because they had uranium and plutonium supplies. And, and so they set up um, spending their first dollars and planning with their first hours uh, with the fact of protecting nuclear materials first. Well, that gave them things like, I don't know, layers of burglar alarm systems, something that you might not need because your number one at asset is people. And the two things that always protect people the most are access control and communications. So if you say, boy, what is the one thing that I can get from this webinar today? It is this, if you've got a dollar to spend and an hour to plan, please focus on access control and communications first. Your communication systems must be nothing less than excellent. Otherwise, I promise Murphy's Law is going to find you, and then you'll improve things. Let's make sure they're excellent now. Same with access control. We're going to say, oh, my, we should never have, you know, have left the passage between the church and the school open during the school day. Again, I'm making it up, but we, what we know is this. Um, in every major school incident that has occurred, there's been a failure of access control. And I know access control is not easy. We've been used to having things just wide open. But I want to remind you, it used to be that you could also in the 70s purchase a vehicle that didn't have seatbelts. And while we may not love wearing seatbelts today, it is the right thing to do that we're required to wear them. And whether you're on sort of the negative side of click it or ticket or the positive side of buckle up for safety, these things that have come into society have made us safer. Um, the fact that we do fire drills um, make us safer. And the statistics bear that out. There's not been one student across America that's died in a school related fire since all of the fire prevention measures went into place 61 years ago after Our Lady of the Angels Catholic School burned to the ground and almost 100 people died, then we were, we were faced with all of these requirements. And, and so let me just say, as we move forward, don't be afraid. Don't think it's a shame that we're losing all of our freedoms. In many cases, we're just getting to a place of safety we should have been in before. Now, beware trendy solutions. I'm going to go right to this next slide, which says, please, please do not purchase classroom barricade devices. These kinds of devices, whether magnet or a sleeve that goes over the door, closer arm at the top of the door, or um, a bracket and we drill holes into the bottom of the th in the threshold of the floor and drop a device into that bracket so no one can open the door from the outside. We don't want to use any of these really great well-intentioned devices because they all violate National Fire Prevention Association codes. They all run into problems with the American with Disabilities Act standards. And Pardon me. They can all be used by the bad guy against us. Now, here's where some of the rub with Alice comes into play. And by the way, I like Alice as well. So, um, David, please hear me. I'm, I'm an, uh, an advocate. But sometimes we'll watch a video in Alice where everyone will have been taught to barricade a door. I'm fine with that as long as none of the barricades are hanging on the door or door frames situation normal. So please hear what I'm saying. If you need to barricade a door and you want to move the desk and chairs and uh, file cabinet, go ahead and do it. Even though most doors swing out, I'm, I'm fine with you, you doing that. If you want to purchase devices like this, I think it's a big mistake because they're there all the time for anybody to use against us. And as I said, violate codes. So walk that tension between the two. At the end of this presentation, I'm gonna give you an article 
that talks about why we don't use secondary locking devices like this. And I think education is always the remedy for ignorance. So um, I'm gonna provide that for you a little bit later. Uh, let's do some better monitoring of exterior activities. Um, when my two daughters were in elementary school, those two girls and 190 other students would go out for recess at the same time. And I always ask people, how many people do you think were monitoring those 200 kids? It turned out to be three. And so what I said is, this is what we can do with three. We can put a perimeter around the students. And so that dogs that are not leashed, um, you know, of uh, vehicles, all the risks are behind us and the students are, are in front of us. What we shouldn't have is two or three monitors standing together and talking. Uh, it's just not, it's just not responsible. We sh and we don't have to do an X marks the spot, but give an area so that we can maintain a perimeter around the kids and make sure each one of them is carrying a whistle. And I don't mean kids, I mean the monitors. Make sure every one of them is, is marked in some kind of a way as being an authority, uh, whether a safety vest or a one size fits all reflective armband. Make sure, again, all of this is in the book, um, but, but let's make sure that we have uh, safety supplies in case a kid gets a, a bloody nose. Let's, let's make sure we have a two way radio so we can communicate lickety split. Um, all of these things are very important. Okay, let's talk a little bit of emergency preparedness in two, two ways, both, both violence and environmental. Then I'm going to give you some, some um, resources and we'll wrap it up. Um, everything that we're doing with lockdown is plus options now. Uh, your default might be locked down, but if your room gets breached, you might have to get out or as a last resort, defend yourself. If you're not in a room when an incident occurs, you're gonna need to find a place to be safe or, or run in the opposite direction. That's why um, the Department of Homeland Security put together a training video called Run, Hide, Fight. Now what you have adopted with ALICE, which stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, Evacuate, is even a better version of run, hide, fight because it's got a training that comes with it. It's a little bit more developed. So I, I, I want to tell you again, you're on the right track going down this road. Just make sure that, that you understand what we're doing is always lockdown plus options. Uh, this is a map of the United States and what it shows us is, um, and, and I'm just going to go with Illinois because that's where I live. Um, Illinois gets on average 54 tornadoes every year. We're far, far more likely to get an environmental or severe weather incident than an active shooter incident. Um, but I still find that people are, are woefully unprepared for these kinds of emergencies or whatever your emergency might be. Maybe it's earthquake or nor'easter or, or whatever it might be. But for severe weather, what we tended to do in the past was put kids in hallways because there were no exterior windows and, and, door, and um, the walls were reinforced. But that's exactly the wrong place to put them. And we have found out since after incidents like Joplin, Missouri, um, where no students were, but cameras were there, that exterior doors give way a lot of times and those hallways become wind tunnels. Anyone who would have been in the hallway in Joplin would have been mutilated with glass and farm equipment and car bumpers. So where do we go instead? We go basements. I know in many parts of the country, we don't have basements uh, or restrooms. Um, and, and look in the photo on the left, you actually see the upstairs of an academic institution. They don't even want people to try to get downstairs, just get right into these restrooms, which are also labeled tornado shelters. The one on the right um, is on the main level. That particular school has a basement, which would be wonderful for tornado sheltering. So they put a sign on the main level pointing to the stairs going down. I hope the rest of them are self-explanatory. I just want to caution you, walk around your school. Let's make sure we're prepared for emergencies as much as possible. Let's make sure that we have bomb threats. Uh, uh, I'm <laughs> We don't want bomb threats. We want bomb threat checklists in case we get bomb threats. See, David, this is my warning to hurry up and head toward the finish line. Um, but we should have that checklist. Um, and again, I've got all of this is in the book for you. 
but you can Google bomb school bomb threat checklist. It should be right underneath every phone that could receive a call from the outside. You should have the United States Postal Service suspicious mail or packages poster wherever you sort your mail. Um, if you don't have a crisis flip chart so people have easy access to procedures, you may have an app today. Um, but we do need to let people know what we want them to do in the event of emergencies. Um, in the photo here is what we call the classroom emergency backpack. You can put these together for a fairly nominal fee. And, and we see that we have things like flashlight that doesn't need batteries, mylar blankets, water supplies, et cetera. And remember with drills and exercises, there's only two times we know if our emergency procedures work. One of those is during the actual emergency, which is an inconvenient time to find out if they don't work then. So we want to practice that is the value of drills. Um, so now let me wrap with the security resources slide. Um, I'm not gonna go in major detail through this, um, but the first one is a Department of Education Response and Emergency Management for Schools is what REM stands for. It's a toolbox of resources for you. Everything from tabletop exercises you can use in your own school um, to, to emergency um, response um, uh, resources. So that's all there for you. There are two DHS bullets, the second and the fourth. DHS stands for Department of Homeland Security. The first one is what to do in, for, for a bomb threat. The, 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 the second one, which is bullet number four, is active shooter preparedness. PASS guidelines, and David, this is brand new. It just came out a couple of months ago. PASS is the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's a group of people in any number of vocations and entities across the U.S., including the guy who is the security director for the uh, Littleton Public Schools and, and people that, that sell cameras. And all of these people put their agendas aside and developed um, kind of the ABCs of school safety, and you can get the guidelines for free by going to that link right there. There are two YouTube videos. One is Run, Hide, Fight. So if you've never seen that video before, I think you should see it. It's about five minutes. It was, it was filmed in Houston. The other one is called The Seven Signs of Terrorism. And I know that sounds scary, but if we see any of these seven things, it's time to call the police. I'm just going to bring one to your attention. That is, if we see somebody who's conducting surveillance on our property. And what I mean by that is maybe somebody who's across the street and we've got kids outside and they're looking on, on our activity with field glasses or somebody walking through our parking lot and you can see they're taking video with their smartphone. It's just time to call the police. They're gonna find out in 99 point something percent of the times that it was nothing, it was just harmless but it is a police matter. They want to know if somebody's conducting surveillance. Uh, About.usps is the suspicious mail or packages poster that, you, that I just mentioned. Training.fema is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and that is that incident command system course that I talked about earlier when you saw the diagram. That's where we go and take the course for free online, and we get a little certificate at the end that we're now NIMS 100 certified. And then the last one, I Dig Hardware, is a, a site where you can find an article about classroom barricade devices. And it, again, it talks about pros and cons. It's, it's an educational article, and I think really the definitive article um, today that we, we have. Um, okay, I'm going to turn things back over to David, but I do want to mention this. Whether it's webinar or personal training or your adoption of Alice, just remember this, application it, it determines the value of the program or webinar or training that we had. So given the, the short time that I had today and, and the amount of material I had to cover, I would ask you, what can you do upon returning to your school or upon revisiting your initiatives make application on the things you heard. That is really what will determine the value of this webinar and of my book and of the Alice program, et cetera. And as somebody that is not just a security consultant, but a dad and a fellow believer, uh, I want to thank you for everything you're doing in your stewardship to provide a safe learning environment. Thank you very much. 
Oh, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate the the time you were able to give us, as well as the incredible resources that you you you've shared and made available to us, both uh, in the the links that you shared there, uh, your comments, and of course your book, uh, which I know our our listeners are going to to find extremely valuable. Uh, I have gone th- read the book cover to cover, um, and it is just an incredibly practical. Uh, tool. There are templates, there are guides. It is a very, very practical resource and, and highly valuable. If, if someone wants to know what I'm talking about, go ahead and look that up on Amazon. Uh, if you don't want to wait for us to send you a copy and uh, you'll see the kind of value you have there. Um, another thing I want to mention is I'm going to ask Elizabeth. We, we of course, are going to take this webinar and we'll post it on YouTube so that if you wanted to reference it back um, or specifically if you wanted to catch those links that Paul sh- uh, shared with us I'll ask Elizabeth to share those links in the uh, I don't know what you call it the description the show notes essentially of of the the video on YouTube um, our channel is, you know, if you just search on YouTube for Adventist Risk Management, uh, the big blue logo, uh, you'll get to the right place. And if you subscribe to us there, you click the little bell, it'll let you know whenever we post one of these resources. So um, really just want to put those resources in your hands in the, in the uh, most efficient and effective way possible. So thank you each one for spending this time with us. Again, we are going to be sending a whole package of information out to you, including uh, Paul's book and a training voucher uh, for the Alice Web training, as well as a number of other resources. You may be aware Adventist Risk Management has on our website many resources available for you, including a school self-inspection form, which goes beyond security. It gets into many safety uh, aspects. We have an off-site activity planning checklist. Uh, so many different resources that we want to make available to you. My big thank you uh, is to Paul for spending the time with us today and also to everyone who chose to take this time to learn more about school security so that our schools can be some of the most effective and safe places for our kids to learn more about um, God, the world around them in a safe Christian environment. So thank you so much to each one for all that you do. Uh, So uh, let's close. Uh, Thank you, Paul. And to everyone on the call, uh, take care and we'll catch you next time.